Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Concepcion, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suludum, for uh, uh, being with us today. Uh, the next speaker in uh, this session is uh, known to many. Um, he's Dr. Mario Aurelio. Dr. Aurelio is currently director and is a professor at the National Institute of Geological Sciences of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Among his research interests is the study of active faults and their associated earthquakes. Mario is a product of uh, NIGS UP uh, and his PhD dissertation from the University uh, Université, French, Université Pierre at Marie Curie in Paris dealt with the active tectonics associated with the Philippine Fault. In his spare time, he makes music with the Unconformity Band that he co-founded. Uh, Dr. Mario Aurelio is actually also currently the representative of the country to the International Seabed Authority, of which he's been attending nightly uh, sessions uh, for a month now. So without further ado, may I ask uh, Dr. Dr. Aurelio to present his talk? Thank you, Alisa. Uh, I hope everyone hears me. May I yes, get yeah. some confirmation? Okay. Uh, yes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone because I see that we have attendees from the other side of the globe. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the Philippine Association, Philippine American Association of uh, Science and Engineering, just, uh, for this invitation to give a a uh, talk on one of my research uh, interests. And then, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Yusek Rene Solidum, uh, a colleague also way back in college and until now, of course, in the uh, in the profession. And um, to everyone else who will be listening in advance, thank you in advance for listening at my presentation. Okay, I'll take the cue also from uh, Yusek Solidum uh, with regards to uh, disasters, hazards, and then when they become disasters, when they inflict damage, they become disasters. Uh, and, but then I'll speak uh, about a very particular event or series of events that happened quite very recently, and uh, Yusek Silidum actually mentioned this also briefly in among the most recent earthquakes. And uh, as is shown in my title, which I will now show you in slide mode, I hope it appears as a slide mode now, in slide mode now. Yes, it's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, stress change analysis of the October to December 2019 Cotabato earthquake sequence. I'd like to recognize my co-authors who I think are present in the room. That's uh, Jago Escudero, my advisee, and Yvette Sisista, one of my research assistants at the moment uh, in one of our projects at NICS. Now, in um, between October 16 and um, actually October 31, because the fifth earthquake took place uh, more than a month later in December 15. There was a series of earthquakes of um, magnitude 6 or higher, four of them. Um, in um, earthquake theory, this is quite um, unusual because if a fault, if a single fault ruptures or moves, then the magnitudes of the earthquakes would be um, exponentially decreasing from the main shock into the aftershocks, meaning if you had a magnitude earthquake whose main shock uh, was say seven magnitude, then the next uh, earthquakes, which are its aftershocks would be uh, an order of magnitude lower. For example, magnitude six, magnitude five, and so on and so forth. Um, but then in Cotabato, uh, the earthquakes that uh, happened in succession four times, in two weeks, uh, all had magnitudes of six or greater. So um, I'm just impressing upon the audience now that that series of earthquakes was, was quite unusual. Even for us uh, geoscientists, it is rather a surprise for this to happen. I wrote a, a um, brief um, article in one of the dailies uh, at the time, but this was for general readership. 
So what I intend to do now is to maybe go a little bit on the technical side and discuss a certain methodology to analyze earthquakes, which is called the column stress transfer. Of course, uh, this is not new. This is um, this was um, actually uh, it started out uh, as a uh, an experiment of Professor Ross Stein of the USGS some 20 years ago or even longer than that. But uh, up to today, this is one of the, um, the, the techniques that many um, scientists who are interested in understanding faults and their associated earthquakes to see if there is any um, relationship between uh, successive earthquakes, one earthquake triggering another or not. So um, the, the technique is um, quite useful in, in many uh, uh, instances, but often, uh, it is applied to earthquakes, um, a sequence of earthquakes where there appears to be a relationship um, between and among them. So what you are looking at now is a, an animation, um, it's a time-lapse animation of from October 16 to December 31, uh, sorry, to October 31, so that's uh, two weeks time, how the four major earthquakes and their aftershocks um, distributed both spatially as well as temporally, meaning what you're looking at in terms of the animation now is uh, really in sequence in time. And as you see, of course, the dots, which are the epicent location of the epicenters, are appearing at particular localities. And there's a trend that it's going, um, let's say, to the upper right, which is in a map that's the northeast. Uh, also in that map, um, please refer to uh, the labels because in the succeeding slides I will be making mention of them also, are the volcanic centers which are close to or in the vicinity of the cluster of earthquakes during those two weeks. Uh, and I'm referring to on the upper right hand is Mount Apo and in the lower part is Mount Matutum. These are two active, uh, well Mount Apo is not an active volcano but it's a potentially active volcano, but Mount Matutum is classified as an active volcano. So um, if I proceed now to uh, the next slide, which is a comparison of uh, earthquake sequences, but in two different places and in two different time frames. What you are looking at on the right hand side is uh, this similar, a similar figure that I've shown in the previous uh, animation, the Cotabato earthquakes and the four major shocks. On the left hand side, are also four major earthquakes with magnitudes greater than six, but happening in the Visayas, not in two weeks, but in five years. So there were four magnitude greater than magnitude six earthquakes occurring in the Visayan area um, from October, from um, February of 2012, that's a Negros earthquake, all the way down to 2017. Uh, those are the earthquakes in Leyte and Surigao. But all of these earthquakes were damaging, relatively speaking, especially in Negros and Bohol, as well as the one in Leyte. Uh, but uh, Surigao, because it happened in the, the rupture or the, the um, focus of shaking, the center of shaking was in a rather remote area. But of course, there was also damage and there was a rupture that was shown. But the point here is that, um, Yes, indeed, in the Philippines, we experience very frequent earthquakes. Fibolx warns us always that uh, we experience, they at least measure about 20 felt earthquakes every day. And uh, in general, every five years or so, I guess, based on historical statistics, um, every five years, there would be a damaging earthquake. And perhaps um, these two uh, sequences certainly are not within not only within five years, but um, in shorter periods of time. And I think that's the interest in, that's the motivation in uh, this type of studies because uh, sometimes, well, very often nature uh, doesn't seem to uh, behave uh, uh, according to what we know as physical laws, like uh, just as I mentioned a while ago, with respect to the magnitude of earthquakes decreasing uh, as they wane from the main shock. Uh, also, of course, the motivation of uh, looking at these studies is of uh, doing these studies is the damage they do um, when, as I said, when hazards become disasters. And uh, the photographs you're looking at are uh, those that, that we snapped in, in Cotabato when we did the field work. 
but uh, while we were doing the, the field work to gather um, data to support uh, what we know um, in terms of our models, we also conducted actually a survey asking the residents, the people, uh, how they, they experienced the earthquake. And one very common um, observation by the affected uh, communities was that in the four events that happened, uh, the first was in October 16, there were two in October 29, and the third one in October 31st. And the very common answer to a um, uh, formulated question when we asked them because we'd like to do a survey to, to um, in order to um, standardize the, the question, is that the damage actually to their houses, uh, as you can see them on the photographs now, actually took place, happened on the fourth event, meaning that on October 15, 29, and the tour squeaks in 29, there were, in gen generally speaking, their houses were still standing, but already damaged. But on the 31st of October, uh, with a magnitude 6.4, if I remember right, that's when the, the, the houses, majority of the houses, collapse. So um, you see the, the, the effect of earthquakes in infrastructure is cumulative, meaning that perhaps the first uh, event, the first shock, the first hit may not damage yet uh, the, the infrastructure, but if it happens in succession, especially over, over a very short period of time, then uh, that's where intense damage can happen. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Soludum was, uh, of course, uh, talking about uh, the West Valley Fault a while ago, among the other earthquakes. But um, imagine that happening in Metro Manila, four successive earthquakes uh, in a span of, say, two weeks, uh, like what happened in Cotabato, would be really something to be prepared for. Now, the specific methodology I was mentioning about is this column stress transfer or change. Um, many of, uh, of the attendees in the room, I'm sure, are experts of this uh, technique. Uh, I already can mention uh, JD, who is now doing his PhD in Oxford. I've not seen him in the room, but I guess I, I'm sure he's, uh, he's also attending. And this is part, um, this technique, he's doing it also as part of his thesis, his thesis. But for now, let me just summarize what the principle, what's the principle behind this uh, technique. It simply says that when a fault moves, it has a, certain, a fault with a certain length moves. Then the portion which ruptures, which moves, releases the accumulated energy. Remember that earthquakes occur because along a fault, when uh, it is still sticking, then there are no earthquakes. But then pressure builds up as, effect, as a general effect of tectonic um, stresses. And when the fault cannot anymore bear the accumulated stress, then the fault captures, and that's when the earthquake occurs. But at the same time, in fact, in a good way, it releases the stress or the energy. But it releases the energy only on the segment that ruptures. In other words, if a certain length of fault, let's say a thousand kilometers of fault, which is uh, the case of the Philippine fault, it's about a thousand and two hundred kilometers long. If only a hundred kilometers of it, a segment of it of uh, 100 kilometers long ruptures, so only the stress accumulated on that 100 kilometer segment will be released. What happened to the other segments? The other segments will be locations or potential locations of stress buildup, meaning because they did not rupture, those segments did not rupture then it will now be potential locations of the building up of stress. And what does that mean? It means that those locations which did not rupture during the earthquake could be potential areas also of the next earthquake. So this is the interest of, um, this is one um, interest, important result of uh, this kind of modeling to determine which parts of the fault after an earthquake could be potential sites of the next earthquake. Um, don't worry too much about the figure below. It's just um, uh, a visualized explanation of how it is, how the final stress distribution is computed. But it's simply, briefly, it's simply a combination of the lateral movement along a lateral fault, as well as the normal components of the the, um, 
the stress. Okay. Uh, this technique, as I mentioned, has been here for quite some time, but one of the more successful applications of this is um, the uh, study of the Great Anatolian Fault or Anatolian Fault in Turkey. In Turkey, they have a very long earthquake, um, well, actually, uh, as comparable in length to the Philippine Fault. It's about also more than a thousand kilometers long. And I'm showing here uh, photographs or um, geographs of figures of uh, uh, where we are in Turkey. And um, that fault has been moving quite regularly and causing earthquakes, very damaging earthquakes, uh, quite regularly. Meaning, for example, as you are seeing on the right hand side of the screen, there was an earthquake in 1939, 1942, sorry, 1943, 1944, 1957, 1967, 1992. And there was another one in 1999. And in the figure, if you now refer to the previous figure, by the way, I failed to mention the, the colors. The colors um, indicate where it is blue. It's an area where stress was released. And when it is red, uh, it is an area where stress has built up. The colors in between are white would be the neutral uh, color uh, and then the colors in between would be a uh, an increasing or decreasing magnitudes of these increases and decreases in released stress and accumulated stress respectively. So in the North Anatolian fault, as you can see on the figure to the right, you notice that the fault has moved in succession from 1939 to 1992 towards the west. And what is the west? West is where you find Istanbul, which is the capital of Turkey. Uh, and so like um, California, uh, Turkey has been waiting for a big one too of their own. And indeed, in 19, you see that the model to the right, the publication to the right by Professor Stein in 1997, uh, it, Okay, it, it uh, took into account the 1992 event, but not the 1999 event, because obviously the publication came out in 1997, before the 1999 event. But it predicted the earthquake in Izmit. Uh, Izmit is that uh, city you find uh, to the west, westernmost um, uh, label in the right-hand side of your screen, the figure to the right of your screen. And so Istanbul is not in that figure, but it's to the west of that, to the left of that. Okay. Now, uh, let's not go too far away from the Philippines and let's look at some examples in the Philippines of this type of study applied to earthquakes in the Philippines. There was one recent one in, um, when was that, 2017? Yes, we, we came out with the paper in 2017 together with, in um, collaboration with some Taiwanese colleagues. Uh, and you're looking at uh, figures of Leyte. Um, Leyte, everyone knows where it is, uh, I hope. But uh, it is also the place where you can find perhaps the most um, well-preserved uh, manifestations or well-preserved morphological expressions of the Philippine fault. And for those who are working in the energy sector, they should be very familiar with uh, the Tongonan geothermal field. And the reason why there is a geothermal field there is because there is both a volcanic center, the source of the geothermal fluids, but at the same time, uh, the ground is um, well prepared to host circulating fluids because it's fractured because of the presence of the Philippine fault. But, um, so that would be on the upside. Uh, we are able to produce geothermal power because uh, there are those two two uh, components, the volcanic uh, source and the fractured ground uh, due to the presence of the fault. But on the other hand, it is also prone to earthquakes. And therefore, um, uh, we have seen that it is in Leyte where uh, among the segments of the Philippine fault, uh, this is perhaps one of the more active ones, meaning the frequency of events uh, along, of rupture events along uh, that later segment is uh, higher than in those in the other segments. And this will also be, I hope, uh, fully discussed in the thesis of JD. Uh, but let's go back to this figure now. What you can see is um, 
the earthquake of 2017, there was a main shock of magnitude uh, 6.5 or 6.7, and there was an aftershock of uh, a lower magnitude, but along a uh, similar trace, almost exactly the same trace. Um, sorry, there's someone else uh, whose microphone is on. Uh, and then, as you can see in the figure below, so remember the, the colors again, uh, blue would be the area where energy is released and red would be areas where uh, the stresses are accumulated. And if you look at the figure on the lower hand side, you would see that, and then the stars are the hypocenters. In the cross section, these are the hypocenters. There are two stars, there's a bigger star and there's a smaller star. The bigger star is the main event, the main shock, and the smaller star is the aftershock. And you can see that the, um, the bigger star flats on the blue area, meaning that when, the earth, when that, shock, when that um, earthquake took place, it is in that blue area where stress was released. Where did the um, stress accumulate? Well, it accumulated, as indicated in that cross-section, over the red areas and orange areas and towards the yellow areas. And that's where you see the aftershock. So meaning that it is very likely that the aftershock was triggered by the main shock, meaning uh, there is a relationship between the, um, it could be explained by way of the, how the stress is transferred from the location of the main shock to the aftershock. However, it is not always the case. Uh, if we take, for example, this time the uh, two earthquakes in the Visayas, on February 12th, there was an earthquake in Negros, and uh, more than a year later, but not less, not, than more, not more than two years, uh, another earthquake, October 15, uh, October 16, uh, 2013, in Bohol. The magnitude of the Negros earthquake was 6.7 or 6.9, while Bohol had a higher magnitude, 7.2 or 7.3. And if you look at that map, uh, and again, remember, recall uh, what those colors mean, there was barely or not any um, accumulation of stress after the Negros earthquake in the Bohol area where the earthquake took place more than a year later. So here it is not clear that um, Negros triggered Bohol. Uh, we presented this in um, one of the geocons uh, right about the time after Bohol earthquake took place, but we also published a paper uh, about it um, in 2014, if I remember right. I cannot read from here uh, the, the copy of the first page of the article that I'm showing now. So in other words, the, there are other factors definitely that contribute to uh, earthquake triggering or perhaps earthquake triggering does not occur at all in other instances. Now, the other, um, the other uh, important result of this kind of model modeling is that you can also um, look at the possible associations of earthquakes taking place at a certain place. And if there are nearby nearby volcanoes, what's the interest in looking at the stress change in such a situation? Well, um, it is um, generally understood or believed that uh, a volcano, the, the magma chamber underneath a volcano, is also uh, very much influenced by the stresses, the condition of stresses underneath in the magma chamber. So in general, higher stresses would mean higher mobility of the magma, and therefore it can translate to volcanic activity like an eruption. So the interest therefore is uh, very briefly, when an earthquake occurs and there's a nearby volcano, then it's possible that the volcanic activity can be triggered by that earthquake. And uh, there's uh, material in literature, for example, what you are looking at now is um, an example in Italy, where the Aquila system of earthquakes, the, the Aquila earthquakes are quite, um, has uh, made the limelight in recent years because it actually caused the imprisonment of some scientists for uh, having or for not having 
properly disseminated the information. This was the accusation, accusation of course, uh, for not having properly disseminated the information to the public or incorrectly disseminating the information to the public. But in any case, uh, it is not the topic of uh, this discussion. But as you can see, um, that segments of the fault system generated uh, or produced um, uh, stress increases over Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius is a well-known volcano, not only because it is uh, very active and frequently um, frequent activity, but also because of its historical historical um, importance. Uh, it's right beside the city of Napoli, of course. Uh, so in the Philippines, what can be an example? In the Philippines, uh, this is an article written by uh, Dr. Bautista, uh, Bart Bautista, who I'm not sure if he's still currently the deputy director of Evolves, I guess, uh, is on his retirement, at least um, uh, this year, yes. But uh, yes, they came out with this paper um, with some indication, not really conclusive if you read the article, that uh, Pinatubo, remember, uh, in 1990, there was July 16, 1990. Um, by the way, it's the 30th year anniversary of the July 16 magnitude 7.8 earthquake. Uh, the epicenter was uh, somewhere in Rizal, Nueva Ecija. Uh, and to the west of it, about 70 or 80 kilometers to the west of it, is Mount Pinatubo. And uh, you can see in the figure of uh, Dr. Bautista that uh, there is a significant stress increase towards Pinatubo, which erupted a year later, June 13, I think was the main eruption, birthday of Dr. Punung Bayan, uh, 1991. Okay, so it is not for me to conclude, of course, if we can... You can look at the article of Dr. Bautista, and if you have a chance, you can chit chat with him or discuss with him and ask for his um, interpretation of these two events. Now, let's go back the, to the Cotabato earthquakes. Um, the Cotabato earthquakes, I'm um, reminding you for by showing again the figure to the left, which I've shown earlier, and uh, for purposes of recalling what the column stress transfer principle means I'm showing to the right hand side of the screen again the principle. Uh, so here are some of the results of the modeling. So what do you need in the modeling? You need um, earthquake data of course and then um, perform the analysis by way of a certain of a code. Um, the millennials call now this an app but it's really a software, it's a code whereby you input uh, some information data. And then uh, there are parameters to, to uh, fill in or to input. And again, as a, as a um, uh, word of what, warning to modelers, of course, anything you put in, the, the quality of the data that you put in, or the, res the quality of the results that you get in modeling, are only is only a reflection of the quality of data that you get in. And uh, let us now talk about how uh, the government uh, agency for health is uh, dealing with uh, the data on uh, COVID, but it's not for, for us to discuss that for now. But yes, if we take a look at uh, this figure, it's about the re trying to see if there is a relationship between the first event, October 16, which was a magnitude 6.4. And the next event after that, the next big event after that, which is which uh, occurred October 29, a bigger event, 6.6. .6. By the way, this is also contrary to um, if it were, uh, if these were aftershocks or main shock with a series of aftershocks, then the, the next event would have been of a lower magnitude. But as you can see in this um, information now, the October 16, 6.4 event was obviously of a lower magnitude of lower magnitude than the 6.6 .6 that happened uh, almost two weeks later. But if you now look at the um, model, uh, you can browse through the map on the left hand side, but the uh, cross section on the right hand side, the upper one, is more telling because there you see that the, main, the October 16 event plots 
within, of course, this stress release zone, the blue zone. And then the event on the 29th plots, which is to the start to the right, uh, there's a label with the date and the magnitude. I hope you can see from your um, monitors, from your laptops, or if you have big screens, that it plots on the red area, meaning the stress increase area. So here, uh, we, we, we can be, we can be, uh, this can be quite convincing, at least uh, accepting that the model is correct. Uh, we can be quite convinced that um, October 16 triggered October 29. However, if we look at October 29 and the next big one, uh, which was about the same magnitude, 6.5, two days apart, and look at the figures, we would see that both of them, the stars again on the upper right hand corner and also the lower right figure, the cross sections, you can always refer the figure to the left for the location of the cross sections. Um, you would see that the two events, October 29 and October 31, both plot on the stress release area, which would suggest that, again, accepting the model is correct, if the model is correct, then uh, these two events, uh, the October 29th event could not have triggered the other event. Perhaps they were existing on the same whole plane or segment, uh, but only en energy was, had to be released twice. Uh, that could be a possibility. Some call this a doublet, uh, but uh, we have not taken a look really on, in terms of the details of whether it's a doublet or not in this study yet. Now, uh, there was an event uh, less than two months later, October, November, December, so one and a half months later, in December 15, we saw that after the October 31st earthquake, there were already four uh, earthquakes of magnitudes greater than six we, six. we saw that the energy accumulated in that area was over, was already released by the four big earthquakes. But lo and behold, alas, there was another big event one and a half months later, and even with a bigger magnitude, because it was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake on December 15. So again, uh, we went back. Uh, in fact, these are very fresh figures from Jagu, my co-author. They just came in this morning, and I had some time to um, include them in this presentation. And if you look at the, the uh, plot now, you would see that there seems to be no relationship between the 31st, at least the, we combined. Uh, so what, uh, what uh, we did here is we combined the effects of the four big earthquakes in October with October 16, uh, because perhaps uh, we, we would think, we can think that uh, the four events, because they happened in a very short period of time, you can cluster them together and then see the effect over the area and see if there's any relationship between those four events and uh, the one big event one and a half months later. But there, ha there appears to be none. Again, because they plot the October, the December 15 event plots on the stress decrease uh, shadow. Now, but then if you dissect the individual events of the October, uh, of the October events, you can see that at least one of them, the October 16 event, could have possibly triggered the 15 December event because, if, again, if you go back to the, sorry, if you go back to the Sorry for that. I have to go back one slide. If you look at this uh, um, cross-section over the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you would see the two stars again. One star, the October 16th event on the blue area, and the second, event, second star over the red area, which is the December 15th event. So there's possibly a triggering uh, relationship between October 16 and December 15. So that's uh, exactly two months um, between each other. Now, uh, as I mentioned, in other areas like in Italy and Pinatubo by uh, Dr. Bart Bautista in 1991, we also tried to look at the effect of the earthquakes over Mount Apo, the closer volcanic edifice, although it's not um, categorized as active, but it's potentially active. But it is also, everyone knows, at least in the geoscientific community, that it is also the location of a big geothermal facility, geothermal plant. And um, if you look at the figures, then uh, 
the map or the cross section or both the map and the cross section they indicate that there is accumulation underneath mount apo uh, now as to how much that accum accumulation is you can refer to the legend um, it's about point 0 0.4 uh, bars in in uh, magnitude in the model of dr bautista it will be too long if i go back to that slide but if you were keen enough to observe the amount of um, uh, stress transferred over Mount Pinatubo was 0 0.1 bars. Uh, here in the model, again accepting the model to be correct, uh, the amount of stress accumulated over Mount Apo is about 0 0.4, between 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 bars. You can make your conclusion as conclusions out of that. Uh, I leave that to the readers. Now, recently, uh, very fresh, um, a few months ago, a, a group of scientists from China, uh, Yongsheng Li and others, uh, published this paper and they used um, radar interferometry, in particular INSAR, to study the earthquakes, but also did um, a similar modeling, column stress transfer modeling and uh, concluded to be brief concluded that um, these faults are part of what in geology are called conjugate faults meaning there are in this case you can see the figures there are northeast southwest trending faults and there are northwest southeast trending faults and in rock mechanics um, this is well supported because uh, if you perform an experiment you break a certain piece of rock by controlled stress uh, conditions then you can see the formation of such conjugate sets okay so that's their interpretation but we are uh, trying to look at in more detail because we were able to gather by the way let me mention that the group of uh, professor yong sheng li who, who is a personal uh, acquaintance of mine uh, did not do field work uh, and you can see clearly in their title, in the title of their article, Conjugate Ruptures and Seismotectonic Implications Based Earthquake Sequence Inferred from Sentinel-1. So they principally made use only of, sat of um, remote sensing material and earthquake data, no field work at all. But we did our own field work uh, after the earthquake several campaigns. Uh, but for now, the takeaways for our CST modeling is that, yes, there are no consistent indications of earthquake triggering because sometimes you see, sometimes you don't, the, the triggering relationship. But um, it is um, quite clear that there is a stress buildup, again, accepting that the model is correct, underneath Mount Apo. And then we quite agree with the um, general conclusions of the uh, work by Professor Lee at all, but um, disagree on certain details, which we will try to address in a publication that we are, we are now trying to write uh, at the moment. And write a paper by involving our colleagues, and in particular, our colleagues now in, in Oxford, that's JD, who, uh, he, who in fact provided us with initial insert data also, when we are trying to look for the ground rupture. Remember that uh, Dr. Solid Doom stressed a while ago that uh, we are maligned as uh, sometimes as uh, fault finders. Yes, indeed, we are fault finders. And the best, really the most convincing evidence in the field of a fault is the rupture, the crack on the ground. And whenever an earthquake occurs, the first thing in the mind of a fault finder will be to go to the site and look for the fault, right? But it is not an easy task it's not an easy job especially when the location of the earthquake is in remote areas in forested areas in inaccessible areas so it is always helpful for remote sensing data like insar or radar to be provided to the field person to the field geologist before going to the field and this is what we tried to do before going to the field and jd kindly provided us with this information and then so um you if you look at the figure on the right hand side there's a map well it's an interferometric map with a line and that line is his interpretation based on the interferometric image of the possible location of the rupture of the crack on the ground 
And so we use that map before going out to the field and then look for that map for that line in the field. Uh, it's quite easy now with the technology of GPS to go to a certain site with, with um, accurate uh, latitude and longitude locations given by GPS. And this is what we saw. Um, there are cracks, not continuous cracks as we, as we would expect, like what happened in the 7.8 magnitude earthquake in uh, 1990. But there is a pattern of those cracks. And in structural geology, we call them an echelon cracks. Uh, it's a French term, but which simply means um, cracks which are overlapping each other, but all directed in a specific orientation and in a specific spacing. And you can use those cracks, an echelon cracks, to deduce the sense of movement of the ground, which we think could be something like this. Um, the figure to the left is a classic example of an echelon cracks, which was observed by our colleagues in FIVOX when an earthquake in Masbate of magnitude 6.2 took place in 2003. Uh, so there was not a clear rupture, but rather a series of cracks. And we think that there's a similar uh, pattern in the cracks that we observed in South Cotabato. Now, this is all we can do at that time, go to the field, see the cracks. And we performed an initial geophysical investigation. We did seismic, uh, seismic um, profiling, but the results are still uh, the data is still being are still being processed. We have initial results of data processing of the seismic profiles, but they are still being uh, improved. And perhaps that will be a topic of a future presentation. Maybe in GeoCon, if we can see each other already face to face or face to face, as some of our colleagues uh, want to prefer or prefer to call it. But uh, yeah. That will be for the next presentation. We'd like to thank the local government units of South Cotabato, in particular their vice governor, who was at that time the acting governor, and the UP Resilience Institute for providing um, logistical support. UP Mindanao also for providing logistical support, and the ener our colleagues from the Energy Development Corporation, who are maintaining the geothermal facility in Mount Apo. Uh, who collaborated with us for the geophysical investigation of the Anachelon Crocs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aurelio. Uh, we have uh, questions in the chat box that uh, we would like to give to you. The first one... Sorry, Dr. Arlampay, should I stop sharing or...? Uh, you can stop sharing if you want or you can put it in question so that the questions can be seen. So this is from Brian Murfito, one of our uh, former students, I think now in FIVOX, if I'm not mistaken. Rather than using aftershocks, are there other ways to validate if there is an increase or decrease in stress on active faults after an earthquake? What could possibly explain an increase of aftershocks on an area with a decrease in stress after the 2012 Negros earthquake? Brian, uh, you're, you're correct, Dr. Alisa, he's one of our students. And in fact, he's my advice. Ah, planted <laughs> <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah, he's my advice. Brian, thank you, Brian, for the question. Uh, there are, I think, two questions there. Uh, rather than, aside from looking at uh, yeah, INSAR or uh, earthquake data, what else uh, can we use? There is a, there is a uh, society or association. Uh -huh. See, the, the, I think he lost the uh, internet. Dr. Aurelio, are you still there? You can probably turn off your uh, video and just uh, use audio. Meron ba? Kaya, Mario? Can you hear me, everyone? Uh, Richmond? Um, Mam Giselle, can you just confirm if you hear me? 
can hear you. Okay, so it's it's Mario, huh? Mario. Oh, it's Mario's connection. What about? Wait a few seconds. Then, if not, move on to the next talk. And the, yeah, and then we then, can uh, later uh, ask the question. Yeah, the question. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I forgot our protocol. We were supposed to ask the questions after um, uh, Doctor Payot's talk. So maybe we can move ahead uh, to uh, Doctor Payot's uh, talk. Um, sorry for uh, forgetting. Uh, our script. 